Irving. No? no. Okay, so I was going to hand the baton over to the speaker, but again, uh, I don't know who the next person is, but everyone, Shimona uh, and the team, thank you so much for putting this together. Thanks, Rabbi. So I'll take over. I don't know if uh, if Rabbi Bookbinder's uh, on, maybe muting everyone uh, just uh, so we can hear the speaker, but... Uh, yeah, I had some, I, sorry, I had some troubles, but sure. uh, we're good now. So I'm going to mute everyone and I'm going to take over controls. So should I put it full screen? I don't know yeah. much about computers. Should I put it full screen? Or do you do that? I don't screen? know. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> Happy birthday, Joe, first of all. I yeah. want to welcome everyone to our second digital yeah. destination. Yeah. Here, it's, it's nice to see everyone again for a second digital destination. Before I introduce our speaker, just wanted uh, to uh, say a few thank yous again. A big thank you to the organizers, to Shimona Petrov, to Judith Gabor. Thank you for having this idea and putting it together, more importantly. And uh, a big thank you to Nancy Klein for organizing the food and also to Rabbi Bookbinder. Thanks everyone who was involved in, in making this happen. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker uh, for this evening. Her name is Mirit Podansky. She was born in Edmonton, grew up in London. She moved to Cranmore, Alberta after graduate school. Canmore. Canmore, Canmore, Alberta, and lives there with her husband and three children. And she's been working in the tourism industry in Banff and Canmore for the past 11 years as in, and is currently program director of a company called Pursuit that owns many major attractions in Banff and Jasper. She's an expert on the Canadian Rockies, its history, and, uh, and she'll be our guide with us this evening. So without further ado, take it away, Marit, one of the most beautiful places in the world, and it's pretty close by. So go ahead. Wow. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Just want to make sure that everybody can hear me and see my screen. Is that working yeah. for you all? Fantastic. And just a quick correction. I've only got one kid uh, so far, uh, just a little one. He's uh, just six weeks old. So if you do hear some newborn cries in the background, um, that's little Zev, uh, my, my new newborn. Um, and I'm just going to encourage you all, uh, if you do have any questions throughout, you can go into the chat function and ask them, or feel free to, to jump in and, and ask any questions uh, as we go along. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here to present to you and to share my passion, which is uh, the Canadian Rockies. Uh, so let's jump right in and um, we're going to learn lots and uh, have a lot of fun. So just a little bit about myself uh, to start with. I've lived in Canmore um, for about 10 years and uh, I've worked in a variety of different tourism positions here in tourism management for Parks Canada, for Tourism Canmore. And I do, um, right now my current job, it's kind of unique and a little interesting. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about it. I'm in charge of experience development for a company called Pursuit. So we create, I create tours and activities and for the visitors that are coming to the Rockies. Um, so I work with our interpretive storytelling teams, like basically training tour guides, but also evaluating them. I go, I spend a lot of time doing research to find new and interesting stories about the Canadian Rockies that we can share with visitors. And I also work to um, appeal to different demographics. So for example, we used to get a lot of visitors from all over the world to the Rockies. As you can imagine this past summer, a few less visitors from places like China and the UK and Australia. So we actually had to change a lot of tours and activities to appeal to a more regional demographic. So that's kind of my job, creating these amazing experiences for visitors to the Canadian Rockies. Um, and personally, my passions include skiing and snowshoeing, canoeing and backcountry camping. So multi-day backpacking trips through the backcountry of Banff and Jasper National Parks. And I'm just, yeah, very excited to, uh, to get to share uh, my passion for the Rockies with you all today. And um, I was get, originally I wanted to take you on a little tour around my neighborhood and show you outside. Unfortunately, it's about minus 25 here without the wind chill today. So I'm gonna stay inside my home uh, for the duration of the presentation. Just a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Banff, 
then about Jasper, and then about my home here in Canmore. I'm going to talk to you about some historic characters, some of the um, people that helped shape the Rockies history. Then we're going to talk about culinary Alberta. I know you've all enjoyed it. Some of you have enjoyed an amazing meal. So we're going to talk a little bit about food and then about Jewish history and landmarks in Alberta. And I really wanted to share this picture. If you can see at the bottom of the picture, it looks like it's taken from a car. And that's because I took this picture on my commute. This is a pretty typical commute in from Banff to uh, Canmore, um, or from Canmore into Banff. And it's just a really, really spectacular drive. So I was thinking of many of you in Toronto and, and busy bustling commutes. And I really wanted to share a picture of, uh, of the spectacular scenery that we see, uh, that I see every moment of every day. So just take, just uh, enjoying that. So we're gonna jump right in and talk a little bit about, just a little bit of an overview. So Banff and Canmore are on Treaty 7 territory, which is a, the, you know, the traditional treaties with the First Nations. Um, the most common First Nations group that frequent this area are the Stony Nakoda people. Um, and a lot of these different First Nations groups came to the mountains to explore. Um, they came for ceremony, they came for trade, but it wasn't necessarily one First Nations group that lived in the mountains, as you can imagine. It's quite a tough climate. So many First Nations lived in the foothills and in the um, in the prairie areas, and just came to the mountains uh, on occasion. So there are four Rocky Mountain National Parks uh, on the Alberta side. We have Banff and Jasper. And that's really what I'm going to focus on today, um, just being my area of expertise. But I also wanted to let you know about the other national parks um, in the mountains, Kootenay and Yoho, which are both in British Columbia. Um, Yoho is host to uh, Emerald Lake and Takaka Falls, and Kootenay has Radium Hot Springs. So definitely worth places um, that you can visit uh, when you're, if you're ever in the area. Um, and then Waterton is a national park that's on the Southern Alberta um, border with Montana. It's kind of interesting because it's one of the world's only international peace parks. So the Waterton is on the Canadian side and Glacier is on the Montana side and the two form one national park together even though they cross two countries. Um, so kind of an interesting, uh, interesting tidbit there. In terms of visiting the area, um, just to give you a general sense for those of you who've maybe not been here before of how far things are apart. Uh, and you know, Canadians, we always measure distance in time, of course, as opposed to distance in kilometers. So from Calgary to Canmore is about an hour, another 20 minutes or so to Banff. And then Banff up to Lake Louise is about 45 minutes and about Banff to Jasper is a, a good three hours. A lot of folks um, want to sort of come and use Banff as their hub and then visit Jasper for the day. But one of the things I always recommend, it is, it is quite a long drive from Banff to Jasper. It takes about three hours. It's a spectacular drive. Um, so I always recommend people spend a few nights in Jasper when they're coming to the area. And then actually driving back down the Icefield Parkway. So this road that I've uh, show you in the map here is the Icefield Parkway, which is one of the most beautiful drives uh, in, in the world. And um, I was recommending it both ways. Lots of people want to drive back from Jasper to Edmonton, but it's kind of a long drive and not the most scenic. Um, but we're going to jump right into Banff. Banff is obviously Canada's first national park. So a little bit of history about the origins of the national park. The way the story goes is, um, in the 1880s, they're building the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, I always like the history of the CPR and train history in Canada. CPR is the only, it, you know, came in, I think they finished it 10 years before it, they had planned to and millions of dollars under budget. And I always like to joke, it's the last government project that's ever come in under budget and, uh, and early. Um, but in 1883, they were building it through the Bow Valley. And you'll see this picture of these three gentlemen. They were railway workers and they were laid off in November for the winter. One of them is actually from your part of the world, from Stratford, Alberta. I'm sorry, Stratford, Ontario, of course, sorry. Um, and these railway boys were laid off and uh, had the, um, they decided to go searching for gold rather than coming back to Ontario. 
Um, they did not find gold, but they found something that we call liquid gold. They found hot springs and finding a nice mm. hot, hot bathe, hot bath on a cold, snowy, uh, snowy winter uh, November day was pretty amazing. As you can imagine, dipping into a hot spring in the cold weather is, would be pretty impressive. So they were very excited. They wrote to the government back in Ontario and said, we want to stake our claim. We want to make this a tourist attraction. We know the train's coming across the country. Um, and this is a great opportunity at, to make a little bit of money. But the government of, the, of Canada at the time thought, well, you know, this is also a, a great opportunity for us. Yellowstone National Park had just become a, a thing in the United States. It was very popular and they needed places for people to go along the train. So the government of Canada said, all right, boys, well, here's a couple bucks, we'll pay you off, and we'll take these hot springs and make them into Canada's first national park. So they set aside 29 square kilometers as Banff National Park. Um, and if you come to Banff, you can visit the Cave and Basin National Historic Site, which is the original site of these hot springs. So that's a little bit of origins of Banff for you. I also wanted to talk about some of the major attractions in Banff. So here are some of the activities and some of the things that you can do um, when, you're, when you're here in Banff. I'm just opening the chat. I see we have a, yes, the Icefield Parkway, very, very spectacular. Oops, I'm gonna go back here. Um, so, sorry, having a technical, technical issue. Just give me one quick second here. Can everybody still see my screen? Excellent. So um, in Banff, here are a couple of major attractions that you can visit. The Banff Gondola takes you to the top of Selfer Mountain. It's pretty spectacular. If you go in to visit the interpretive exhibit there, that's all sort of my, my baby, something that I've sort of planned and organized. And um, so it's very, very cool to visit. Tunnel Mountain is a small hike that you can do in the center of town. The Banff Center for Arts and Creativity is our sort of arts hub uh, in Banff. The Fairmont Banff Springs, I'm sure some of you have recognized pictures of it, the castle in the Rockies, and that's the large uh, Fairmont Hotel. I don't, can't always afford to stay there, but I love to go to the coffee shop and grab a coffee and wander around the property and act like I'm staying there. And it's a really, really beautiful, spectacular building. Fun fact about the Banff Springs, when they first built it, it cost $3.50 to stay there for the night. Um, so I always sort of like that. If you check, if you check the rates for next summer, I think they'll be a, a touch more than that. The Banff Upper Hot Springs is where you can still swim to this day. And Johnston Canyon is a lovely uh, canyon that you can walk along to a really beautiful set of waterfalls. And it's a very easy and accessible hike. It takes about half an hour to the first set of falls and about two hours to the second. So definitely worth doing if you're feeling agile and ready for, for a trek. And then I wanted to talk about three lakes uh, in the area, Lake Minnewanka, Lake Louise, and Moraine Lake. And one, one of the things you'll see lots in my presentation is pictures of my dog, Elsa, the mountain mutt. She is, uh, she is a, a frequent model for my photography. Uh, but you'll see on the left-hand side is Lake Louise uh, with Victoria Glacier in the background. Quite a spectacular place and everyone has to go there if you come to Banff. On the top right is Moraine Lake. And that's my husband and I. That was actually the summer we first moved out here. We met these uh, Israeli backpackers uh, at one of the pubs in town and they didn't have a car. So we offered to, uh, to take them on a private tour of the Rockies. So they took this picture of us and it just goes to show no matter where you are in the world, there's a uh, post army Israeli backpackers who are gonna be exploring the area. But Moraine Lake uh, used to be on the $20 bill. Um, and it's an extremely famous, uh, famous location. These are, it's Valley of the Ten Peaks. So you can count the ten mountain peaks. Um, and yeah, at any type type of advertisement in Canada, it's quite common to see Moraine Lake. It's a pretty am amazing symbol. It does get quite busy there, uh, especially in the summertime. The road is actually closed in the winter, so. I really recommend getting there really earlier in the day or really late in the evening if you're going to go visit Moraine Lake. And then just below is Lake Minnewanka, the one with Elsa, the, the mountain mutt. Lake Minnewanka um, was actually a dammed lake. So it, it is the biggest lake in the park because of the dams that were built in, um, in the 1940s. 
Um, it's the only lake that allows motorboats in the national park. So you can actually take fishing tours here as well as a boat tour. Um, and I highly recommend that. And not just because I've written all the scripts for it, but it's a, it's a great, great boat tour. Uh, a couple of fun facts about Banff itself. Uh, the population is around 8,000. Um, it's pretty small, um, and that's because we have a, something called a need to reside. And what that means is if you live in Banff, you need a reason to live there. So you need to either own a business or work at a business or have some sort of um, proof to the Canadian government that you have to live in Banff. This means that there's no cottages, there's no second homes. Um, it is mostly people's primary residence. I mean, there are ways that people find to skirt around the rules, but officially everybody needs to um, work in the park. It is Canada's busiest national park with 4 million visitors. And while most people assume that um, most people visit in the winter, it's actually busiest in the summertime. So May to October is peak season. And within that July and August and September are really quite busy. September and October are busiest with international visitors. I love to call September seniors September. And that's when many of our international Australian and British and German uh, visitors come. And then in October, it's quite popular for visitors from Asia because they have a, a break in their holidays then. We do have three ski resorts and you can see a picture of, of me in one of them. This is, I'm the very tiny skier in this picture at Sunshine uh, Mountain uh, Village. I just saw a tweet from them today that they're actually closed today because of the cold weather. Um, but uh, the ski resorts are, are quite popular here, Sunshine, Lake Louise and Norquay. Next up, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about Jasper. So Jasper, the other sort of town on the other side of the Icefields Parkway. Its origins are a little bit different. It started out as a fur trade post during the fur trade era. Um, and it was, it's quite a bit farther north. Um, it's where the Canadian National Railway goes. So, you know, if you're sort of familiar with the history of Canada, the CP kind of goes south and the CN is the northern route. Uh, to this day, Jasper really is still a train town. CN High is a, a large employer in town. And the Via Rail still goes through uh, Jasper. The Great Canadian uh, is the name of that train, as well as the Rocky Mountaineer, which is the glass roofed train. I was fortunate a few summers ago to get to ride the Rocky Mountaineer, which is sort of a really incredible, uh, incredible experience. If you're ever uh, feeling like dropping a couple bucks on a, a quite expensive, but quite incredible experience, the Rocky Mountaineer is really unique. And the history of Jasper's tourism is a lot more uh, rough and tumble. So, you know, people are relaxing in these bubbling hot spring thermal waters in Banff, but Jasper's quite rough, you know. Um, a lot of the people that came there were, were really searching for, you know, it was almost the edge of the, at the, edge of the world. Um, the early, uh, the Brewster brothers and the other early uh, tourism providers built these backcountry cabins and they would take guests on, on pack trips by horseback from one cabin to the next to these very remote locations. Um, the saying goes that Jasper is like Banff, but 30 years ago, and no matter where we go in time, it still feels like that. And I've had visitors tell me that when they walk down Jasper, when they walk down the main streets of Jasper, they do feel like it's a step back in time. Um, this picture here is a, a photo from the, actually the Canadian National Railway has an amazing photo archive online. I'm a bit of a, a history nerd as you probably figured out. Um, and this is one of my favorites. It's from the, um, I believe it's the 1940s, but it's uh, when the Icefield Parkway was, uh, was sort of just being built. I think that this was used as a promotional photo. The Icefield Parkway was built mostly as a World War II relief project by conscientious objectors. So kind of a neat fact there. Some of the major attractions in Jasper include Moline Lake, of which this is a picture here. Uh, that's Spirit Island, uh, just an incredible, incredible spot. Moline Canyon, uh, which is a canyon that's fed from the lake. Moline Canyon is such that in the summer you can walk at the top of the canyon and look down into it. And then in the winter it ices over and you can actually walk on the bed of the canyon and look at all these amazing ice falls. It's very, very cool. The Icefield Parkway, which I already talked about. The Columbia Icefield, which is the uh, glacier that you can actually walk on along the Icefield Parkway. 
Uh, the Jasper Tramway, which is Jasper's answer to the Banff Gondola, takes you up to the top of Whistler's Mountain, not to be confused with Whistler, British Columbia. And then the As Athabasca and Sunwapda rivers. So uh, Jasper has a little, little bit more whitewater rafting than in Banff. So for those of you who like a little bit more adventure, these historic rivers also uh, are great, uh, great for rafting. Here are a couple of photos of some of the places I just mentioned, the Skywalk along the Icefield Parkway, the Ice Explorer Tours, and Moline Canyon. There's a picture of me, and again, Elsa the mountain mutt, uh, the greatest model uh, that I've got at Moline Lake. This is us canoeing out to Spirit Island. You could take a boat tour out there uh, that only takes 90 minutes, but I chose to canoe. Um, and it was about five hours each way, but luckily we camped along the shores uh, for a couple nights, so we didn't have to do all 10 hours in one day. The population of Jasper is about 4,000. Um, Marmot Ski Basin is their local ski hill. And uh, the Jasper Park Lodge is there, Fairmont, uh, up in Jasper, um, ha has been host to many famous guests over the years, including Marilyn Monroe when she was filming The River of No Return in the 1950s. As part of my pandemic, uh, pandemic movie watching, I watched all the movies that were filmed in the Rockies. And unfortunately, I didn't really love Marilyn Monroe's The River of No Return, but the scenery is fantastic. And she's famous for having said, that the movie, you know, the movie was bad and she couldn't play second, she played second rate to the amazing Jasper scenery. The Jasper Park Lodge is currently, if you go and try and book a room there tonight, you'll find that it's all booked up. And that's because the reality television show, The Bachelor is actually filming there for six weeks. So that's been the, the, call the hot gossip in Jasper. There was this big mystery booking, who booked the Jasper Park Lodge for six weeks? And we found out it's the American Bachelor. So uh, all my Jasper friends are, are out uh, kind of scoping out, you know, Sometimes we're, we go on wildlife searches to see if we can spot elk and deer. I think they're, they're doing some celebrity searches to see if they can spot single, single bachelor, uh, bachelorettes, people collecting their roses. A couple other cool spots in Jasper are Medicine Lake, uh, which is a, a, a disappearing lake. Uh, so the lake is actually there in the summertime. And then the water sort of, uh, it disappears in the fall and it just looks like a giant mud flat. And they've done all sorts of interesting things to try to find out where the water goes, including putting dye in the water. There's this amazing story from the 1920s of these two guys filling the lake with mattresses to try to, to, try to soak it up and to not let the water disappear. Um, another interesting story is about Jeffrey Pike. And he was actually a Jewish inventor, a British inventor, kind of an eccentric individual. And in World War II, um, the, the allies were looking for kind of unique ways to, um, to help in the Battle of the Atlantic. And one of the ideas that Jeffrey Pike had was to build an ice ship, basically to build, to combat the, the German U-boats, to build a giant ice ship um, that could live in the Atlantic that planes could kind of land on and refuel. Um, so this Jewish inventor, um, worked with the Canadian government to try and build this ice ship. And they chose Jasper um, as a location because it was remote enough, cold enough, and had really easy train access. So even though it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, wouldn't be likely to be spot to have spies in Jasper National Park. Um, so they did this big sort of underground um, secret project called Project Habakkuk at Patricia Lake. It's such a fascinating story. Uh, you can go on Wikipedia and read more about it. There's a CBC podcast called The Secret Life of Canada, and they've actually just done an episode about Project Habakkuk. So I highly recommend listening to that. It's fascinating. I didn't, I, I've known about it for years. I didn't know that Jeffrey Pike was Jewish, but he also has just a fascinating story of escaping from a German POW camp in the First World War. So Really interesting, um, really interesting story. If you come to Jasper and visit Patricia Lake, you can't unfortunately see the ice ship. Uh, ice melts, I guess. So it was destroyed over, over a number of years, but divers who dived, divin, dived <laughs> down into Patricia Lake have found the remnants uh, of the, at least the concrete and asphalt parts of, of the ship. So just an interesting, uh, interesting tidbit into the way uh, World War II history kind of came into our national parks. 
So that's a little bit about Jasper. Moving on to Canmore. So Canmore has a, has a third different story. Unlike Banff, that was a tourism destination and Jasper that was a fur trade post, Canmore was a mining town as they built the train tracks along uh, in 1883. They found a type of coal called anthracite coal. And anthracite coal is very clean burning. It doesn't produce a lot of smoke, really popular for battleships leading into World War I. I always joke that if I'm gonna name, if I was gonna write a book about Canmore's history, I would call it labor unrest and the old west. Uh, because that's what was really going on in Canmore. The mines were uh, brought quite a quite a rough crowd to town, um, and it wasn't uh, wasn't the safest or friendliest place to be. It's just outside the national park, so I mentioned Canmore is about twenty minute drive from Banff, and that's because Parks Canada, the government of Canada, didn't want to have these big heavy industry mines in the national park. They thought it didn't look very didn't look very national park like so they put the border right on the edge of town but as you can imagine coal fell out of favor over the years in the 1960s and 70s a lot of draft dodgers from the vietnam war moved up to canmore and other places in interior british columbia this also brought a wave of artists and bohemians our current mayor of canmore his name is john borrowman and he's a potter and he is part of the sort of wave of people that came in the 70s. And then in 1979, the mines closed and that was it. Everybody's people started assuming that, that Canmore would fall apart, that the town would be no more um, because, of the, because it was just a mining community. But then in 1981, there was a giant international announcement and it saved the town. Anyone have any idea what that might have been? 1981 near Calgary. I'll just tell you, the International Olympic Committee announced that they um, would be hosting the, that Calgary would be the host of the 1988 Olympics and Canmore would be the location for cross country and biathlon skiing. So this revived the town as an Olympic, uh, Olympic host location. And, um, and that sort of, the, the rest is kind of history. The major attractions in Canmore are the Nordic Center uh, Provincial Park, which was the host of the 88 Olympics and is still the training area for cross country and biathlon skiing. I live quite close to the Nordic Center and I like to joke that we have more guns per capita in my neighborhood than anywhere else in Canada. <laughs> um, just because of all the amazing biathletes. Um, actually, I was I have to tell you a quick side story. I was walking my dog the other day and it was a huge snowstorm. So all my neighbors were out shoveling. And I saw Mark Arendt, who is a Canadian biathlete Paralympian, and he only has one arm. And he was shoveling his driveway to the, it was like the most pristine driveway on the block. It was pretty amazing. Um, but it's very cool to um, see these Olympians and Paralympians uh, who live in, and train here in Canmore. Some of the other attractions in town are Kananaskis Provincial Park, which is the um, the provincial air, uh, land to directly south of Canmore. We have lots of art galleries, rock climbing, ice climbing, and mountaineering and caving are actually quite popular activities here. Uh, I have a friend who's an ice climber and when I tell him about the hikes I go on, he says, hiking is the thing you do to get to the ice climbing. <laughs> it's quite, quite adventurous folks. Uh, mountain biking is very popular and we have some great trails, including the Legacy Bike Trail, which is a paved biking trail between Canmore and Banff um, and Grassy Lakes, which is a great little hike. I got a picture of that on the next slide. Um, so the lower right is uh, Grassy Lakes, uh, just a really nice little trail, only takes about an hour to get to. The upper right picture with Elsa the Mountain Mutt was actually taken at the dog park. So this is uh, uh, the dog park near my house in Canmore. Uh, I just I like to include it because it sort of shows that we have just spectacular views from places that aren't even necessarily specific attractions. Just uh, just the, the little neighborhood park. Uh, she's, she's a nice little model for that. A couple of fun facts about Canmore. Um, so we do not have, because we're outside of the National Park, we don't have a need to reside. Anybody can buy property in Canmore. So that's why it has a little bit of a bigger population than Banff or Jasper. 
around 15,000 residents. And that includes many second homeowners and people who have cottages here. Canmore is home to more Olympians and Everest summiteers per capita than anywhere else in Canada. Um, which I always think is sort of a fun fact. Some of the famous residents include Barry Blanchard, who's a, a very famous Canadian alpinist and he lives, in my, lives just down the street from me. Will Gadd, who you may remember ice climbed Niagara Falls a few years ago. Does anyone remember that when, when Niagara Falls iced over and there was an ice climber that actually climbed the falls? Well, that was Will Gadd and he lives here in Canmore. Sarah Renner, who's a cross country uh, Olympic skier and Clara Hughes. Anyone know who Clara Hughes is? She's also quite famous for having won medals in both winter and summer Olympics. So she's a uh, uh, pretty amazing. I believe it's uh, speed skating and, and some sort of cycling, but I'm not an expert. She has a, a series of books and is just an amazing, uh, amazing athlete. Canmore is named after King Malcolm III of Scotland. And it means big head in Gaelic. Uh, so I think King Malcolm had quite a big head. He was quite proud of himself. So we've named the town after him. So that's a little bit about Banff, Jasper, and Canmore. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, some historic characters, but before I do, I'm just gonna see if there's any questions in the chat. Any questions? No? Okay, well, feel free to include any if you have any. So I'm gonna talk about two historic characters uh, who kind of help shape the Canadian Rockies and make these, and they both sort of shed some light into what it was like here in those early days. So one of them is this grizzly fella. His name is uh, Bill Pato. Bill Pato was one of the early park wardens in Banff when Banff was first established. He built a series of backcountry cabins uh, throughout the backcountry of Banff National Park. I've, I've actually been able to see some of these in the wild. It took me two or three days to hike out to them, but it's very cool to be sort of far away from any kind of civilization and just come across this little cabin. But Bill Pato's famous story is the lynx story. So back in the day before um, we sort of worked to coexist with the wildlife in the national park, there was actually a zoo in the center of downtown Banff. And Parks Canada maintained the zoo and it was an opportunity for people to actually see all the wildlife without having to, to go on a hike or to, or to explore the back country. And they really wanted a lynx for the zoo. Does everyone know what a lynx is? Sort of a wild mountain cat. Um, so they wanted a lynx. They asked Bill Pato to go get one. So he went up 40 Mile Creek, which is just not too far from the town of Banff, caught himself a lynx, put it on his back and marched into town. He walked into the bar at the Mount Royal Hotel and everyone sort of, you know, nods their caps to Bill Pato. And all of a sudden they see this wild mountain cat and sort of purrs and, and moves on his back. People were terrified. These are sort of crazy wild animals. So the bar emptied out and Bill Pato got to enjoy his drink in peace and solitude. Sort of shows that the first kind of people that came to this area, they were adventurers, they were, um, they were seeking solitude in, in the mountains and uh, they were a little bit wild as the saying goes. Another historic character I like to talk about is Mary Schaefer. Um, Mary Schaefer was a, a, a woman from Philadelphia, sort of an aristocratic type. And she had a, a, a tough year. Her uh, husband, who was 20 years older than her, passed away quite young. He was a botanist who had taken her on expeditions in the mountains. And her parents also died the same year. So Mary Schaefer was having a tough time and she decided to continue her husband's work. He saw her husband, the botanist, was uh, categorizing some of the flora and fauna of the Canadian Rockies and writing a book about the plant life here. And she decided in 1907 to come back and to actually continue his records and continue documenting uh, the plants and, and animals here. And she met a family uh, during her travels, a stony family by the name of the Beaver family. And they were telling her about a lake, about a mysterious lake that the First Nations people knew about, but that no white person, no person of European descent had ever been able to find. 
And she spent two sub summers exploring the mountains and finally found the legendary Moline Lake. She was the first European to find it. Um, and then in 1911, the Royal Geographic Society of Canada wanted the area surveyed. And so they actually hired Mary Schaefer to be the official surveyor. And she went back with her guides and with her friends and spent the summer surveying the lake. And so the idea is she found the lake and then she literally put it on the map. She was just an amazing uh, trailblazer and explorer and uh, really, uh, really ahead of her time. She ended up marrying one of her guides, Billy Warren, who was 20 years younger. So I always sort of like that, that her first husband was a little bit older, her second husband a little younger. And they retired to Banff together. And there's still, you can go visit her, uh, the cabin that, uh, that, that she retired in. Just a fun little fact about that is it's actually right next to the Banff Cemetery. And Mary Schaefer said that, you know, she really, uh, at first she kind of felt a little creeped out living right next to the cemetery, but she eventually appreciated, appreciated how quiet her neighbors were. So I like that. Um, but she's just an amazing artist and painter. This uh, photograph is actually a lantern slide. So what she did is she would take these old black and white photographs that were taken and she would paint over them painstakingly uh, to bring them color. This was sort of one of the original ways to get color photography. And I'm just seeing that we've got a couple um, questions in the chat. So let me just take a quick break. Paint a lake is a favorite for sure. Um, what is the hotel to stay at in Canmore? That's a really good question. Uh, there, there are quite a lot. One of the big differences between Banff and Canmore, most of the hotels in Banff tend to be sort of what I would call like traditional hotel rooms. You walk in, there's some beds um, and a bathroom. In Canmore, most of the hotels are uh, condo hotels. So most of them are sort of timeshare types, but anybody can come in and stay there. And you usually have a living room and a kitchen and, and it's quite common to have, um, to have your own uh, sort of facilities. It's one of the reasons why in COVID times, Canmore is still quite popular because people really like to have their own little unit to themselves. Um, so some of the, the nice hotels in Canmore, uh, the Malcolm is the newest hotel. Malcolm, obviously after King Malcolm of Scotland. Um, Solera and um, Silver, what's it called? Silver Creek um, and, um, and the Grand Rockies are all great condo hotels. But if you're looking for something a little bit different, um, the cross country uh, Olympian who I mentioned, Sarah Renner, owns a little property downtown called Paintbox Lodge. And it's a, it's a cute little like, uh, you know, like six room boutique kind of bed and breakfast type place. Uh, very unique stay. They do these uh, cooking classes called uh, cooking at the box um, uh, sort of events. I actually went a few years ago. There's a Israeli baker in Calgary um, who owns a bakery called Sidewalk Citizen and he came out and did a sa sourdough baking workshop at the paint box lodge so I was uh, quite keen to learn how to make sourdough from an Israeli um, and uh, yeah paint box lodge is qu quite a neat little spot so that's uh, that's worth worth checking out um, if you're coming to Canmore let me just see if I can see any more questions in the chat sorry didn't Grail manage the National Park in Jasper in the 1920s or 1930s? That's a really good question. Um, my understanding is that Grey Owl is a little bit more on the Saskatchewan side. Um, I, think, I think he may have come to Jasper, but um, I was actually just up at, I did a canoe trip, uh, uh, six months pregnant this summer, a canoe trip across Prince Albert National Park in Northern Saskatchewan. And I know that we, we went to Grey Owl's cabin up there. Um, and I think he, he may have been a little bit more centered in the, uh, I may be incorrect, but I think he was a little more centered on the Saskatchewan side. Um, and that Jasper, um, Jasper had a little bit uh, less of a, a First Nations influence. It's actually quite interesting though, because there were a group of Métis families who lived in Jasper. And when Jasper became a national park, they actually evicted the Métis families and they ended up having to go um, kind of to the uh, to different areas uh, in the foothills of the Rockies. But there's an amazing website called Mountain Métis. It's mountainmétis.com or .ca. And you can read the story of, of the people that were evicted from the national park. So that's something that 
you know, on a lot of tours, we don't talk enough about uh, the way that uh, that First Nations people were. That the story of our national parks creation is also the story of um, of, of of difficult times for our First Nations friends. Here's another quick question. If we were to visit Camwer Jasper Ramp, how much time would we ideally expect to spend there and see most of the worthwhile sites? Excellent question. Uh, and it's it's tough to answer. I've lived here for 10 years and I haven't seen everything that there is to see. Um, but there are lots of different ways that you can do it. So I definitely recommend uh, either staying in Canmore or Banff. Um, you can use Canmore as a base or use Banff as a base. And, and really, if you want to at least explore some of the major sites, minimum two nights um, at least, and, and probably up to like four or five would be ideal. And then, you know, some folks like to stay in Lake Louise because they like to stay at the Chateau along Lake Louise or the Post Hotel there. Um, but you can really explore that area from Banff if you want to use it as a hub. It depends if you're the kind of person that likes to stay at a bunch of different places um, or if you like to kind of have your little place and then and use it as a base. Um, and then uh, and then at least two nights in Jasper uh, for sure. But you could spend probably up to three, three or four. If you had if you had like a solid week, I'd probably recommend doing four nights in uh, Banff and two nights in Jasper, and then one in either Edmonton or Calgary, uh, depending on um, where you're starting and ending. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about Alberta's food scene, and then I want to talk about a little bit about some Jewish landmarks. Um, but feel free to continue to jump in and ask any questions as I'm uh, as I'm talking. Um, so the Canadian Rockies uh, have an interesting culinary scene. I actually have a, a part-time job as a, a tour guide for Alberta food tours. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out if you're in the area. Um, there's also Jasper food tours in Jasper. And they're starting to do these cool things called picnics, where they take people to the tops of mountains and then cook a meal for them. It's quite, quite cool. Um, but we have farmers markets in both Banff and Jasper and community gardens. And one of the things in this picture that I wanted to point out is the fencing. So you see that there's a picture of some my, my tour guests and a large fence behind our community garden. Now we have a huge six foot fence, um, but there's no lock on the door on the on the gate to the community garden. So I'm wondering if anyone might know why we have such a large fence, but no, no locks. Well, I'll tell you, it's not because we're trying to keep people out of the community garden. It's because of the wildlife, of course. So we have deer and elk and bears and cougars and coyotes and fox and bighorn sheep and all sorts of animals that uh, that would want to get into our food. So it's actually illegal in Banff, Jasper and Canmore to have your own little garden. You can't really grow your own food. You know, there's a, some people I know put little mint plants and things like that out on their back decks or in their backyards. They don't usually get scolded, but you can actually get fined if you have a bird feeder even because bird feeders are bear attractants. Um, so we have these fenced in community gardens. Growing things in the Canadian Rockies, as you can imagine, is very challenging. We have a very short growing season um, and uh, with really extreme temperatures and lots of wildlife can get into it. A fun fact, though, is I was up at the Fairmont Banff Springs recently um, last summer, and I noticed they do have a little garden and I was asking them about it. And it turns out that they have a garden, but they only grow one vegetable, and that's rhubarb. And apparently rhubarb is very poisonous to wildlife, so it's the only thing that they're allowed to grow. They've also started a beehive on the roof of the Vamp Springs, so I think if you go to the springs, you can get honey that's made directly from there, so kind of a cool fact. I wanted to talk a little bit about Alberta's seven signature foods. So we did a... Um, a project uh, called Cook It Raw a few years ago where they brought chefs from all over Alberta to come determine what are Alberta's signature foods, what makes Alberta's food scene so unique. And this is the list that they came up with. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there's a couple I just wanted to really quickly mention. Um, bison, honey, and canola. Uh, so bison I wanted to mention because of the bison reintroduction project. So this is a project that Parks Canada has been doing over many years to bring bison, to bring wild bison back uh, to the national parks. 
Um, so there are bison that are housed at Elk Island National Park, but that's a fenced in national park and they really wanted to have wild roaming bison free in Banff. Um, so they actually used sea cans and helicopters uh, to bring them back here. Uh, and the Panther Valley Pack currently sits at about 35. So it's pretty amazing to have these wild bison roaming, roaming the plain, roaming the mountains once again. Um, my husband and some friends decided that they wanted to go find the bison last summer. So they packed their bags and went on a five day backcountry camping trip to go to the Panther Valley to find the bison. They hiked for five days and they found a couple piles of bison poop and that's about it. So I think the bison actually have moved around into the backcountry. It just goes to show how big an area it is. You can follow along the, the Banff bison story on Parks Canada's bison blog. So I definitely recommend checking out and watching some of their videos. Uh, I wanted to mention Alberta honey, which I kind of already alluded to. Um, Alberta is the, produces 40% of Canada's honey. It's a huge honey producing area. And you'll see a picture of, um, of a bear um, as well as uh, getting, into some, getting into some honey there. That's at the Fallen Timber Meadery, which is just a, 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 a meadery near, uh, near Calgary. And um, just goes to show how wildlife can get into all sorts of different kinds of food. It's a real, it was a story on the CBC. It was a real Winnie the Pooh situation. And then I want to talk about Alberta canola, uh, which is, uh, canola is a huge um, uh, crop here in Alberta. And I really like this picture and it reminds me of a certain country's flag. I'm wondering if anyone, I'm going to open up the chat, if anyone knows what country's flag looks like this, uh, this picture here. And let's see if we have any, oops, let's see if we have any comments in the chat. Any local kosher restaurants? I'm gonna get to that. You just, you wait. Ukraine, Rachel from Toronto says the Ukraine. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. One second here, sorry. Having a little, a little more technical issues. There we go. Sorry, let me just close the chat here. So, Sorry. Um, so the Ukraine, um, does anyone know? So, uh, just give me one more second while I get this, uh, get this sorted out. Stop sharing. Just one moment, please. There we go. All right. So the reason that I really wanted to share uh, this image and talk about the Ukraine out of all places is because Alberta has a huge Ukrainian population. And a lot of Ukrainians, when they first got here to Alberta, they saw these bright yellow fields and this bright blue sky, and it really reminded them of their home in the Ukraine. And a lot of the original Jewish settlers who came to Alberta felt the same way. Uh, so I want to talk about a little bit about Jewish history. In 1911, there was about 600 Jews in the province of Alberta, mostly came from Ukraine, as well as Russia and Romania, and they were homesteaders. I know we don't think a lot about 1911 Jewish farmers, but a lot of these people did come to work the land and lived side by side uh, to their other Eastern European uh, uh, counterparts. Um, but a lot of the Jews uh, of Alberta decided that they didn't really want to be farmers. It was a really, really hard life in the early 1900s. And so a lot of them moved to the cities. Um, over the years, there's a pretty big increase in population, uh, people coming from Israel, especially from South Africa and from other, other places around the world. There are now around 8,000 Jews in Calgary and around 5,000 in Edmonton. So pretty significant Jewish populations with Jewish day schools, Federation, Jewish community centers, uh, as well as synagogues. Um, but there's no formal Jewish organizations here in the Canadian Rockies. I always joke that uh, Banff, Jasper, and Canmore are the only places in the world without Chabad, but we do have a Chabad close by in Calgary. Um, and the Jews of Alberta, just they've just done very well. We had a Jewish mayor in Edmonton, um, and uh, you know they own sports franchises in Edmonton, shopping centers like West Edmonton Mall. Um, and um, even though we don't have a lot of Jewish organizations here in the Rockies, uh, you know we are very close with our uh, Jewish communities in Calgary and in Edmonton. 
Uh, one of the best Jewish landmarks to visit when you're visiting Alberta is that uh, this little building right here, this is, uh, they call it the Little Synagogue on the Prairie. And this is a building um, that was used as a synagogue by a small colony of Jews that were along the Alberta Saskatchewan border, and it was built in 1916. It's one of the few surviving examples of this old frontier style temple. And in 2008, the Calgary Jewish community worked to actually move this building um, from, the, from where it was homesteading, from the prairies, into Heritage Park in Calgary. So Heritage Park is the big historic park in the center of Calgary. It's sort of a giant history living museum, um, very, very popular tourist attraction in Calgary. And it's the first Jewish house of worship to be housed in any Can Canadian historic park. Uh, again, this is one of those very cool stories of the Jewish community working together to bring this important landmark. Um, and now, you know, millions of visitors uh, of all faiths uh, get to visit and, and check it out uh, every year when they visit H Heritage Park. Um, you can read more about the project to move this building um, at jewishcalgary.org. So I've got the link in the presentation right there. And I know someone asked about kosher restaurants. I definitely wanted to chat about that and about Calgary kosher. I've always loved the Calgary Kosher Heckscher, which is, of course, a cowboy hat. What would it, what else would it be? But then I just found out doing research for this presentation that Calgary Kosher doesn't exist anymore. And now it's banded together with Edmonton Kosher to be Alberta Kosher. And I don't know about you folks, but I think I like the original logo better than the new ABK logo, right? <laughs> um, but there, uh, when you're visiting Alberta, definitely look out for these logos. I wanted to include some kosher restaurants in Calgary and in Edmonton. Uh, I haven't tried the ones in Calgary, but I have been to Cafe Levy, Cafe Levy at the West Edmonton Mall. You may know that West Edmonton Mall is owned by the Garmazian family, a lovely Jewish family in Edmonton. And so they are sure to have good kosher food available in Edmonton. And then a couple, there are many grocery stores uh, in Calgary and Edmonton, especially in the south um, of Calgary, that have really good kosher meat selection. So um, I just have to kind of make my way into the city uh, uh, to stock up. Um, in Canmore and Banff and Jasper, there really isn't any uh, uh, kosher, um, kosher meat options. Uh, when I first moved here, I went to the grocery store a week before Pesach, thinking that I would be able to find matzah in my local store. And uh, I did get to give my, uh, um, the grocery store uh, folks a bit of a lecture about, uh, about Jewish history and told them all about the story of Passover. But unfortunately, we have to go to the city to, to get matzah. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about kosher food in Alberta. And that's, uh, that's sort of the bulk of my presentation. Now, I know you can't talk about the Canadian Rockies without talking about wildlife. So I have included a couple photos here of some bears and elk and um, a marmot that I've taken. Um, but I wanted to yeah, open it up and see if we have any more questions about the Canadian Rockies. So it's not just me chattering away. So let's see if I can get the chat working now. Hmm. You know what? Let me just stop sharing for a second here. Have I been on a CMH summer climbing trip? Really good question. Um, I actually haven't, um, but I have a good friend who's the, who does the sales and marketing for uh, CMH for their summer adventures. So for those of you who might not be aware, CMH is Canadian Mountain Holidays. Um, and it's a company that started as a backcountry ski, um, uh, sorry, heli ski company. They own, I'm trying to remember if it's like 10 or 13, they own quite a number of these big lodges that you can only either access by helicopter, um, and they do these heli skiing adventures. And then a few years ago, maybe within the last 10 years, they realized, you know, the summer is also a popular time to come visit. Um, so they've actually opened them up for summer, uh, summer adventuring. Some of them you can just book a public um, public visit to the lodge. So you're staying there with a whole group of people or you can actually book out the lodge yourself. Uh, costs a pretty penny, but a very cool experience. Um, one of my uh, colleagues uh, went on one of their family weekends where you can actually bring kids out to the lodges and uh, it was, I said it was just an incredible experience. I'm more of a skier than a climber. I like to have my feet on the ground, but climbing is just uh, incredible, incredible um, here in the Rockies uh, and very, very popular activity. Um, can I talk about more of the Rocky Mountain train ride? Where does it go? Where does it end? Can you get off and then get back on? 
Yeah, so I'll, I, so there are the two ways to, to train visit the area. There's the Great Canadian, which is the Via Rail train that goes through Jasper. Um, but I think you're probably referring to the Rocky Mountaineer, which is the sort of creme de la creme exper way to experience the Rockies. Um, I definitely recommend going RockyMountaineer.com and reading more, but they have a couple different routes. Um, most of them go from Vancouver and then stop in Kamloops and then go either to Banff or Vancouver, Kamloops, Jasper. Um, and then there is a northern one that goes up to Prince Albert, um, not Prince Albert, sorry, Prince George, Prince Rupert, Prince George, one of the places in Northern British Columbia. Um, and they used to have a Vancouver, Seattle leg, but I think that that one's been discontinued. Um, but basically the Rocky Mountaineer is a glass roofed train. So the entire, you're basically getting an amazing 360 degree view above you. It only travels during the daytime. So for example, you could take it from Vancouver to Kamloops and then they take you to a hotel in Kamloops. And then the next day you get back on the train and go from Kamloops to Banff or Kamloops to Jasper. Um, if you get the gold package, it's a all you can drink kind of situation. And that's the one that I did. I highly recommend it. They come by very frequently with amazing sort of snacks and amazing cocktails and drinks. The food on it is amazing. I think like the ratio of guests to staff is like two to one. So for every two guests, there's, there's one person kind of, uh, like looking after your every need. The Rocky Mountaineer really is a very, very special experience. Very popular um, with the over 50 crowd uh, from Australia and the UK uh, and Americans as well. Um, so definitely uh, look more into it. It's, um, it's expensive, but uh, I think it's worth it. But um, yeah, you'd have to kind of see, see what works for you. Um, and so not, you've asked if they start in Calgary. They don't, you could start in Calgary. Um, but most people get on the trains in Banff or Jasper or in Vancouver. It's actually quite popular to take the train from Banff or Jasper to Vancouver and then in Vancouver get on an Alaskan cruise. Um, so that's sort of the most popular thing for international visitors to do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a nice way to sort of combine it, combine it all together. Um, and yeah, the Rocky Mountain Year, it I've, I've unfortunately didn't run last summer. I'm hoping to see it running up again, again next year. Um, but generally people would get off in Banff and Jasper. You don't really need to go all the way uh, to Calgary on the train. And interestingly enough, um, the train sort of comes to Banff. Basically everybody gets off the train or gets on the train. And then it runs empty all the way from Banff to Calgary. And I couldn't figure out why. If everybody's getting off in Banff or Jasper, why does the train go all the way from Banff to Calgary? And then I found out it's because it needs to turn around. There's nowhere in the Canadian Rockies for a train of that size to actually do a turnaround. We just don't have a big train yard to do that. So it goes to Calgary, turns around and drives back. <laughs> That's sort of a fun fact. Um, can you take the train from Toronto to Calgary? No, you can't, unfortunately. Um, so there's no via, there's no via rail uh, in southern Alberta. The, the via rail that goes across the country actually goes through Edmonton and Jasper and then down to Vancouver from there. Um, so it's sort of interesting. You could take a train to Edmonton and then take uh, buses. And there's lots of uh, bus companies that do bus travel throughout the Canadian Rockies. Um, excellent. Oh, let's get, get some more questions here. Um, are the Badlands close to Banff and Jasper? Yes, it's actually super cool because a couple of years ago we were, my husband and I and Elsa the Mountain Mutt were camping one weekend in Banff and we were a little, you know, you have to watch out for bears, keep your food in your car or in a, in a bear locker. And then the very next weekend we went to uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park and Drumheller, uh, which is the Canadian Badlands. And there was signs up that said, look out for scorpions and snakes. And I thought, how amazing to drive three hours away and go from bear country to scorpion country. It's pretty amazing. But if you can imagine, if Calgary is sort of right here and the Canadian Rockies are on this side and it's about an hour and a half or so to Canmore and Banff, then exactly an hour and a half in the other direction eastward is where you get to Drumheller and the Badlands. The air there is very arid. They have these amazing hoodoos and rock formations. I highly recommend uh, recommend checking it out. Alberta has like tons of amazing provincial parks um, and Dinosaur Provincial Park uh, is definitely one of them if you're at all interested in dinosaurs and in that kind of uh, amazing natural landscape. 
Um, some more questions. Um, did I major in tourism? How did I get so knowledgeable? Um, I have an undergraduate in history from Dalhousie University and a master's in film studies. Um, but I've got knowledgeable by just being, uh, being living here for so long, working in the tourism industry. My job uh, sends me to the archives at our local museums because, you know, maybe one of our tour guides will, will get a question and, and we'll actually go and I'll actually go and do research and, and, um, and find more information. I do a lot of fact checking of tour guides. I do a lot of evaluations of tour guides. And I've uh, gotten the pleasure to, to work with many people who have lived in the Rockies their entire lives. So I've gotten an opportunity to learn a lot about the area and I'm just a bit of a history nerd. So, uh, so yeah, I've learned a lot. Um, where are my snowshoes? I actually, I, I could run around the house. I've got some of those old vintage snowshoes, but I also have some of the modern metal types, um, but they're, they're upstairs. I'm just calling, I'm calling in from the basement. Um, Someone said $304 from Toronto to Edmonton via rail. Yeah, those are really, uh, really good, at really good rates right now. Actually during Canada 150, does anyone remember where they did a, a, a thing for youth in Canada where they were like for $150, you can get an all access pass. And then so many people signed up that they had to sort of stop selling right away. Uh, yeah, via definitely is a good, good way to travel. Um, someone's asking if Elsa is named from Frozen. No, she's not. She's 10 years old. She's pre-frozen. Um, but one of my great stories about Elsa the Mountain Mutt is I was on this quite intense trail with her and this little girl walks up along the trail and I see her parents way off into the distance. She walks up to me. She must have been like, you know, like four or five. No, maybe like six. Anyways, she asks me, what's your dog's name? Can I pet her? And I say, of course. And I say, her name is Elsa. And this little girl is so excited that this dog's name is Elsa. She screams on the top of her lungs. Her parents way up the trail can like barely see. They come running they think she's being attacked by a bear. But no, it's just, she's excited about the fact that my dog is named Elsa. <laughs> um, some other questions here. Edmonton's great, lots to do, great community, uh, hospitality for kosher and any tourists. Yes, Edmonton, I was born there. It's amazing, um, such a great city, such a great Jewish community. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really lovely people there. Um, my favorite place name in Canada is Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. Yes, it's a really interesting, uh, interesting provincial uh, historic site. Um, where the, they would actually um, sort of herd the buffalo off of the jump um, and, um, and um, as, a, as a way to hunt. And also really beautiful landscape down there. Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump can be visited in conjunction with Waterton National Park and another place called Bar U Ranch, which is um, the original sort of historic site dedicated to ranching in, in Alberta. Um, can we call you when you get there? Yes. Yes, I'll, I can provide my contact information. Anybody wants a little private tour of the Rockies, let me know. Um, what is your contact info should we need it? I'm going to put it right here in the chat. Marie at gmail.com. Normally, I would provide my work contact information, um, but I'm on maternity leave because I've got the little, the little baby. Um, Oh, I just realized that that was a direct message, but I've sent it to everybody. Anyways, now you all have my uh, email address uh, if you should have any follow-up questions. So I think that's probably, we're probably getting up to time right now because uh, I know I've talked a lot. Uh, any last questions about the Canadian Rockies, about myself, about anything else? Uh... Mirit, I wanna thank you for speaking with us. Definitely your passion comes across. It's infectious. And uh, I think you'll get a lot of bookings from this. Uh, uh, so get ready for a whole bunch of uh, Jews from Toronto showing up at your front door. I gave you two extra children. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for that, but mazel tov on your new edition on Zev. Thank you. And um, one shout out, a shout out to Mike Berlin uh, for connecting us to, to Mirit and uh, his claim to fame, among other things, is that he's the Petrov son-in-law from Calgary. So uh, thanks, Mike, for making that connection. And again, thanks, everyone, for being with us. And I want to remind everyone to sign up for our next digital destination on March 9th, which uh, will have us traveling to Israel with our Rabbi and Rabbitson just in time for Pesach, a free Pesach 
visit to Israel, unfortunately, virtually. So thanks, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks, Marit. Thanks, Marit. Thank you. It's great. Thank you so much, Marit. Bye. Thanks, so Marie. nice to see everybody. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. You really was great. Thank you. That was really, really tremendous. Thanks, Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. That was fabulous. Thank you. How are you doing, Ross? Living Thank the dream you, in Winnipeg. <laughs> minus tw minus twenty five. Oh my God. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi. Hi, Mark. It's Hi. actually thirty seven. Log off. <laughs> okay. Could you post Hi, the Howard. email address again, Pardon? please? What no? is the email address, please? Yeah, I've uh, forwarded the email address on the chat. If you open the uh, chat, you'll see Mirit's uh, email address there. Yeah, to feel free it. to email me. Do you have any questions or need okay, any advice or anything like that? How's the baby? Email. Good. <laughs> Still asleep. You look great, Marie. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. This was so much fun. And you did such an amazing job. Thank you. And, and only on three hours sleep. <laughs> okay. Me, Reed, I don't know how you're doing it. When I have a six week old baby, I'm under the covers and not wanting anybody to see me and can't even get a legible sentence out of my mouth. So it, it gave me an excuse to take a shower. So <laughs> but you know, the nice thing about having a baby during a pandemic is there's nowhere to go. I never feel left out of anything. You know? yeah, that's true. I think I missed it. Where are you from originally, uh, Marie? I was born in Edmonton um, and I grew up in London, Ontario. My dad lives in Toronto. On my screen, he's just right next to me. Um, oh. And um, yeah, and I, I moved here to Canmore when I finished uh, finished university uh, to be a ski bum and then just never left. So you're originally from? From, I was born in Edmonton. You were born out in the Rockies. Yeah, yeah, basically. but I grew, but I lived, uh, we moved when I was five to London, Ontario. So I grew up there. And so you missed the Rockies. That's why you moved out there? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I had graduated, I graduated university and, it was right in 2009 and, and a lot of people were, you know, the economic crisis, people were finding it hard to find jobs. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I thought I'm going to go out to the mountains and be a ski bum and ski for a few seasons and, and, um, and, and decide what I want to do with the rest of my life. And then when I got here, I realized not a lot of people come out to the Rockies and want to work, work hard and, and kind of, uh, um, build a career and build a life here. Uh, and so I was able to do that. And, and now I'm raising a little, a little mountain baby <laughs> and, uh, and the dog, of course. So have you written a book about your experiences? No, I haven't, uh, but I've got lots of time, I think. Uh, it was wonderful. That. I felt just like I was there with you. You did a wonderful job. God bless well, you. Thank you. I put a link to uh, your story about Elsa on the chat. Oh, oh yeah, the with, with the little the little girl who is a little uh, Yeah. It was it was quite funny. And I do get that a lot of people ask me if she's named after Frozen. So for people who don't know, I'm Mike Berlin. I'm Shimona Petrov's uh, son-in-law. And this is uh, Sam. And Marie and I haven't met. We have a mutual friend in common. But honestly, I've lived in Alberta my whole life. And I'm not making this up. This is the best presentation on Alberta Rockies I've ever heard in my life. And I'm seriously not making it up. It was very impressive. And uh, nice to finally meet you, Marie. Yeah, it's really nice to meet you, too. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. I'm like... Basically sharing my passion in the Canadian Rockies has been my job and when I worked at Parks Canada and when I worked at Tourism Camor, I'm just, I'm like, I love the mountains. I love when people come visit. I'm the kind of person that when I'm like on my lunch break at work in Banff and someone's standing and looking at a map, I like stop them and I'm like, how can I help you? What do you want to do today? And I've actually met a lot of like Israeli tourists that way and um, and just met people. I, I If you stand on Banff Ave long enough, you, the entire world will pass you by. So I kind of love the living in a small town, but getting to experience people from all over the world and getting to kind of share this special place with them. So I'm glad I got to do it, share it all with you today. And yeah, really nice to meet you. How far is it from Canmore to Ben? 
It takes about 20, yeah, 15, 20 minute drive. Um, or you can bike. It takes about two hours to bicycle between the two. I don't bike. I'm very unathletic. Don't, don't bike. Never learned to ride a bike. Well, it's e it's an easy drive. It's it's my commute. So it's, uh, yeah, really, really spectacular. That's wonderful. Fabulous. Is it yeah, expensive? Is it expensive to live out there? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, our, our cost of living is actually quite high. In Banff, most of the people who work, um, work, you know, for tour companies and restaurants and hotels live in staff accommodation. Um, so they are, their employers provide them with a place to stay. Whereas in Canmore, um, uh, it's, um, yeah, we, we, most people don't live in staff accommodation. They live in sort of apartments or houses. And yeah, it is quite expensive. Uh, there's the Canadian Rockies tax. I like to joke that, uh, you know, I asked my boss, for a raise once and he said your payment is the beautiful mountain scenery <laughs> so um you know many people work in hospitality and they don't necessarily make a ton of money but it's so worth it for all the outdoor recreation and calgary is really close by so lots of my friends actually will go do their grocery shopping in, Ca in calgary and ellen it looks like you've got a question yeah i'm a world traveler and i am dying to you know do canada and um i mean i've done out east uh, I, I would love to go to Churchill to be with the polar bears. And uh, so Churchill is Manitoba, or, or also that's sort of for winter and summer is the beluga. But I would love to go west to you, like you have no idea. Uh, I've never been to Jasper, I've never been to Lake Louise, all these places that you mentioned. And I wish, you know, a tour of some kind, a trip of some kind could be organized. I would love to do it. And, you know, that little boutique hotel that you mentioned is my speed all the way. And I would love that. It, interestingly, actually, um, I know a group of tour guides in Jasper. So the, the polar bear season in Churchill, I believe, is like September, October, maybe. Yeah. But... I know a group of tour guides in Jasper. It's such a short season um, that a lot of, they actually bring in a lot of tour guides. So I know a group of tour guides in Jasper who go to Churchill and do polar bear tours uh, during the off season in Jasper because the two tour seasons kind of complement each other. Um, and I have, I've not been to Churchill, but I've heard amazing things. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, Especially, I'm, I'm hoping that one of the things that the pandemic teaches us is that even though the world is big and we all want to travel, like Canada is amazing. We live in an amazing country. Um, there are so many places to explore. My friends went up to Torngat National Park in northern Newfoundland or up to Callowit. There's a, a, a hiking trail you can do between Alaska and Yukon that's on my bucket list. Like there are so many incredible, incredible places in Canada to explore. And so before you sort of start looking at the Paris and London and Australia, like there's some really cool stuff to do in our own backyard. So Ellen, I hope you'll come out to the Rockies and visit me. I've included my email. Feel so I, I, I just put my email there to you directly. Do you see it? Perfect. Yes, I see it. Perfect. And that's my birthday right there. Oh, awesome. Very okay, cool. so it, it, that's, that's how I remember it. <laughs> Whatever, I'm talking too much. No, it's good. Anybody else have any questions? I just wanted to say I've been from Anchorage to Seward and then went on the uh, uh, the cruise and oh, it was cool. wonderful. But uh, I'd love to uh, visit uh, Banff and uh, Jasper and the way you say there's uh, kosher places, which is wonderful. I'm very uh, surprised. I don't know why I should be, but I've even seen uh, Hebrew writing on uh, the uh, trip uh, visiting um, along where you stop uh, the train stops on the way from uh, Anchorage to Seward, and uh, there was some Hebrew writing on one of the um, glass blowing things. And I said, "Jewish people, you know, why are we so surprised? Jewish people They're travel cool. the world, you know, They're everywhere. Sure. Travel yeah. Europe, and I found Alaska far more fascinating, especially the trip that goes with the um, glass top um, train from Anchorage to Seward. It's fascinating. So I think I'd like the one, uh, the Rocky Mountaineer. Yeah, very." Um, Any you're, other fascinating, you're a fascinating lady. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any Great. other final thoughts or other questions? Muted thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to end uh, the Zoom uh, so you can get back and get some rest because we're taking <laughs> away from your precious rest time and we don't want to take advantage of you. But thank no, you. No. And this is uh, wonderful. We hope to see yeah. everyone next month for the uh, next uh, destination. Nancy, what's our next destination? Israel.
Israel. That's oh, right. Wonderful. Israel. So hope to see you all in Israel virtually yes. next month. Bye-bye.